now. So welcome everyone to our online meeting of the Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society. Um, this was possibly our last uh, online only meeting uh, because uh, if you have been keeping an eye out in the channel, um, our next meeting will be our first in-person meeting. However, we are keeping an eye on things in regards to the three active cases in the last few days. Uh, and we'll let you know if there's any developments. But at this stage, yes, we'll all be meeting again in two weeks' time. Um, so uh, that'll be really good. Uh, we're also kind of looking at uh, running the... Um, uh, carrying on with the online meetings because we've got such uh, fantastic guests uh, from around the country and this is a perfect way that uh, we can actually get to speak to them and hear what they have to say as well. So um, you're all more than welcome to join us you know, in our, our in-person meeting and or if you are around about the country, so I can't make that, of course, uh, you can uh, join us uh, for our online meetings in the future. Uh, there is a possibility that we will be um, doing our in-person meetings uh, streamed onto YouTube as well, so keep an eye on that. So I'm going to hand over to Josh for the news, and then we will be popping over uh, to uh, Heratina and Sam. So over to you, Josh. Hey, thanks, James. Hi everyone, I'm Josh, and I'll be running us through astronomy news, what's been happening recently in the news. So let me just share that. And so astronomy news, what's been happening above us? So last week we had an interesting sight. It was a strawberry moon penumbral lunar eclipse. So what does that mean? Well, when there's a full moon in June, it's known as the strawberry moon, or apparently there are other names as well. I had no idea there were so many names. It's also known as the Mead moon, rose moon, or even thunder moon. I think it's a really interesting name, almost sounds like a superhero of some sort. And a penumbral lunar eclipse. Well, we're all familiar with the idea of a total lunar eclipse, where the earth moves between the sun and the moon, and the moon is completely in the earth's shadow. With the penumbral one, it's sort of partly in shadow so it's not enough to fully make it go black or black it out but it's enough to make it go dim or change the color as we can see in this shot here so this eclipse was visible over parts of africa europe asia and australia i don't believe it was visible here in new zealand but still there's some some interesting shots came out of that Also in the news, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has unfortunately been delayed again. So we've covered this a few times uh, in previous meetings. So this is a $9.8 billion space telescope project. It's been in the work for years and unfortunately it has a history of being delayed due to one thing or another. The latest target date was to be March 2021 but NASA has just announced that they're no longer on track to meet that target date. And the main reason this time around is it's been delayed due to coronavirus. Obviously with what's been happening with the coronavirus and the, the, the global pandemic, a lot of NASA centers and teams have switched their focus to help track the virus spread, looking at things that might help us, you know, how to combat the virus. So because work has been done on the space telescope, so it might be a, a while longer until we finally see this in the, the sky. Talking about things in the sky, familiar with the SpaceX Starlink satellites. So this is part of SpaceX's plan to bring internet to rural areas. And it's, it's a real year in theory, but of course, what we're noticing is the more of these Starlink satellites that get put into space, it's causing issues for astronomy and other research. As you can see in these photos here, we've got these annoying streaks in the way of all this sort of viewing going on. So the, the latest development is SpaceX is now listening to some of the complaints from scientists and astronomers, and they're trying to work out ways to make their satellites less disruptive. So they've been trying a few different approaches. One approach is what they call the dark set satellites, 
where they basically just paint the reflective surfaces black. So some of the ones that were launched, I think in the last batch or the one before, were of this dark sap variety. They found that this helps a bit and that now they're effectively invisible to some, I guess, sort of low range telescopes and things like that, but they are still noticeable. So one of the other things they're trying is what they're calling visor sat satellites. And these satellites actually have visors which block sunlight from reaching the reflective surfaces. So that means that they're not as bright. So they've had a bit of luck with that. One of the other things that they're looking to do is uh, when the SpaceX Starlink satellites launch, for a period of time, they're, they're launching and sort of climbing up to their orbit. And then once they reach orbit, they're, they're in orbit. And oftentimes it's during that initial phase when they're most disruptive. So what they're doing now is during the launch and climb phase, they're actually going to maneuver the panels to point away from Earth. So if you imagine, you know, if this is Earth here, the, the panel will be pointing sort of like this. So when we look up at it, there's less surface area. So these are just some of the things that SpaceX is doing to try to make these less disruptive. Will it work entirely? Well, let's watch and find out. But at least they're trying to do something. Also in the news, mysterious bright patches on Titan are now thought to be dry lake beds. Now, if we've spoken in the past about Saturn's moon, Titan, and this is interesting because it's the only known cosmic body with surface liquid apart from Earth. So in the whole solar system, this is the only other place where we know that there is stable liquid. It has lakes, it has its own weather system. And back in 2000 to 2008, some radio telescopes here on Earth observed some bright regions on Titan. And it was thought at the time, oh, these must be lakes. And then the Cassini spacecraft was launched. It orbited Titan between 2004 to 2017. And it looked in these same areas to see if it could find proof that these lakes were here. But it actually didn't find any lakes. So it's been a bit of a mystery as to what these things are. We saw them from Earth, but on Cassini, we, we can't see any water. But anyway, some new research has gone back and looked at those original photos. And now we think that those bright spots are actually dry lake beds. So just to be clear, on Titan, we know there are lakes, there are lots of lakes all around, but these, these really bright spots that we thought were lakes are probably just dry lake beds. So one of the reasons that this is significant is it just means that going forward, maybe we need to be a bit more cautious about our searches for exoplanets and things like that, because now we know that, hey, if we look at this thing from Earth, maybe it looks like water, but actually maybe it's just a dry lake bed. So maybe we just need to bear that in mind. On the topic of exoplanets, new research suggests that maybe we should be looking at dusty exoplanets a bit more. So generally, when we look at exoplanets, we try to focus on planets that we think might be Earth-like because we're interested to know, are there other planets that could have life or could support life? But one of the things that we generally haven't considered in the past is dust in the atmosphere. So some new research looked at dusty planets, specifically looking at M dwarf planets in synchronous rotation. So what this means is planets that are rotating around M dwarf stars, stars that are smaller and cooler than our own sun, specifically ones that are in synchronous rotation. That means that the way the planet rotates, one side of it is always facing its sun. So what that means is one half of the planet is always hot, and the other half is always cold. And you might think, well, in that sort of situation, it's probably not gonna be good for life because you know one side's too hot, the other side's too cold. But the new finding suggests that airborne dust could moderate those temperatures. So if it's, a, if it's particularly dusty, that can help to keep the hot side cool and the cold side warm. And what this means is this can actually widen the window of distance away from the sun that we should be looking because generally, if we're looking at exoplanets, there's sort of a narrow window in terms of distance away from a star where it's not too hot, not too cold. But this new research suggests, well, with dusty planets, maybe it gives us more leeway there because it can actually moderate the temperatures. But of course, the downside is that the dust can make observation of these planets more difficult. So there's pros and cons. 
Also, in terms of planets and new life, uh, there's a new study out that suggests that there could be 36 alien civilizations in our galaxy. That seems like a very specific number, almost uh, suspiciously specific. So what this research has done is they've looked at the Drake equation. This is something we've spoken about before. The Drake equation was, I think, developed in the 1960s. And it's a mathematical formula that allows us to estimate the number of potential alien civilizations based on a number of different factors. So you take a whole bunch of numbers like the, the number of stars, the number of planets around stars, the number of planets that we think could have life, etc., and you so it's times them all together and you end up with a number. So this new research is using the same equation, but it's looking at new data about star formation and exoplanets that we didn't know before. It's also looking at things like, well, with an exoplanet, let's also try to focus on exoplanets that might have minerals, that could have metals, because we want a planet that could have develop, for example, a radio transmission. So that we can actually communicate. So based on all of this, the thinking is that there could be 36 alien civilizations, intelligent civilizations that are communicating just within our galaxy. But we should say that there's a big margin of error there because in the same study, they also said it could be as low as four or as high as 211. But if there is 36, this study also suggests that if we assume the civilizations are like equally spaced around the galaxy, then the closest one to us is probably 17,000 light years away. So that would definitely pose problems if we're trying to talk to them. And finally in the news, the International Space Station gets a new toilet. So, of course, NASA being NASA, they don't call it a toilet. They call it the Universal Waste Management System. And they promise that this new toilet for the ISS will be more comfortable than the current toilet. So I was doing some reading about this, and what I didn't realize is that on the International Space Station, on the, on the Russian side, they have a, a Russian toilet. And on the US side, they have this other toilet. And apparently, the, the slight differences in how they've developed it. So NASA plans to update the one on the US side of the space station to be more comfortable. And you might think, okay, why is this newsworthy? This is a, 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 it's the toilet. Well, the thing is, if we're serious about future space missions and looking at possibly going to the moon more or going to the Mars, we really need to solve the problem of space toilets. We need a more efficient system because in this article, it was saying that a mission to Mars could generate 270 kilograms of solid waste. That's a lot. And it wasn't clear to me in the article whether they meant that was from one person or if they're assuming this mission is maybe two or three people. But in any case, if our plan is just to have it there on the, the station or the ship and store it, it's going to cause long trips. That's a lot of weight. And more weight means more you know, fuel, other considerations. So this, this new uh, universal waste management system that NASA is developing for International Space Station, this is just one small step in the continuing research that they want to do to make better and more efficient toilets so eventually we can go to Mars. And that's it for the astronomy news in terms of what's been happening above us. As James mentioned, at this stage, we're planning our next meeting to be an in-person meeting. But if that changes, we'll send out communications and email and Facebook and things like that. So for now, I'll hand things back to James. Over to you, James. Okay, thanks, Josh, for that. Um, yeah, so um, it's quite interesting there about the space toilet, eh? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, some of the things I suppose we don't really think about until we get told about it. But uh, there you go. It looked like a very interesting device for sure. So, yeah, that's a better, better one. Okay, uh, so it's my great pleasure to welcome two guests tonight. Um, Haratina. Uh, who's the executive director of the New Zealand Astrobiology Network, 
senior science communicator for Space Place down in the Carter Observatory in Wellington. Uh, she's a founding board member of Kiwi Space and the New Zealand Mars Society. Uh, and I could just go on and on and on. I've known Haratina uh, for quite a few years now, and um, I've always been quite amazed at all the things that she gets involved with. Um, Sam uh, grew up in the South Island and uh, much like myself got to see Halley's Comet back in 86 and uh, uh, it certainly made a big impact on me and I think on him as well. So uh, Sam has um, got tertiary level qualifications in geography and philosophy and he's just recently started uh, studying in astrophysics, so much like old Chris. Uh, by the way, I must congratulate Chris. Uh, he got his results back, 95%, I think it was. So well done, Chris. And um, so getting back to Sam. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> um, so he spends his, uh, most of his working career in public service and spare time in astronomy outreach and also being assisting with the New Zealand Astrobiology Network. So that's been really great. Um, it's really good to have you guys on. So if you could unmute yourself. Thank you, James. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm a bit worried about that 270 uh, kilogram um, waste product that uh, might be generated on the way to Mars. It would be a rather unpleasant asteroid to encounter if they uh, didn't keep it on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is quite, quite an unusual one. You know, it's, I was reading actually another article unrelated to that where they were saying they were using... Uh, human waste within the walls of the spacecraft uh, uh, to protect from uh, certain of the um, radiation. So that's probably another one. <laughs> well, this is actually has been discussed with the Mars training and the Mars missions is one of the, the viable options. Other option would be to have plants or hmm. you know, algae but something because water is a very good um, insulator. Yeah, um, you've got a, one person saying uh, that they're very impressed with the ISS toilet and uh, a question from one of the viewers saying, well, which way does it flush? <laughs> no, I guess it depends, depends on, on uh, which hemisphere. Which hemisphere yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'll be an interesting one. Anyway, uh, take it away, guys. All up to you. Thank you. I will share a screen. And so hopefully you can see. Uh... I can't, can't see it yet. Oh. Are we having problems? Oh, there we go. All right. Are we there yet? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's all there. You're oh, ready to go. This is our, our web page, Milky Way Kiwi. And we put um, a lot of things that we find interesting, we'll put them up on this uh, website. A lot like the news, actually, um, that uh, Chris was going through, those kind of things, those interest uh, pieces that people you know like to read and, and stuff. But we also uh, put quite a lot of just astronomy stuff up there. We like to put up uh, videos on how to find objects um, or constellations, things like the Southern Cross. And at this time of the year, of course, uh, information about how to find Matariki. Um, and, you know, really any, anything that kind of interests us, <laughs> we just assume it must interest other people. <laughs> like, <laughs> we seem to be interested in anything. Like, space, so. Yeah, well, we just saw Sombrero <laughs> Galaxy in the weekend, and it was the best. I was it a bit um, jumpy, is it? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see us, ours okay, right? So we just did this um, video on Sombrero Galaxy. Well, because we had a look at it on Saturday night and, and it was quite, it was pretty easy to find. Uh, and it looks absolutely amazing. We do most of our observing with a 16-inch reflector, uh, which, which is fantastic. It's you know, quite heavy to get it in position, but once we're there, it's, it's, it's good fun to use. Uh, so we, we often quite like looking at galaxies in it. 
And we go to a dark sky location in the Wairapa at Stonehenge Aotearoa, which is a, a lovely spot in a great area that's got hardly any light pollution. And it's fantastic as an open air planetarium uh, almost. And in fact, when you go and stand in the, in the Stonehenge, uh, circular hinge thing, um, it's very much like a planetarium. It's, you know, the dome yeah. above you is... It just is, doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> go forward <laughs> on a press of a button. And it's very difficult to heat in winter. And sometimes <laughs> it rains inside it, but other than yeah. that, it's perfect. Yeah. So we, we really enjoy looking at it. But anyway, on Saturday, of course, we, we were looking in the area around Virgo and Corvus, uh, between uh, you know, Corvus and the, and the Southern Cross, having a look at all those really lovely sites. Um, M83, Centaurus A, Omega Centauri, and of course Sombrero. And, and then uh, down further towards the horizon, looking at the Virgo cluster, and, and then across it to Leo, looking at the Leo triplet thing. So we thought, well, actually, Sombrero was so cool to look at, and it's such a you know beautiful galaxy, and you see those really amazing photos that people take, and of course the photos that Hubble has taken, which are absolutely inspiring. And I think a lot of these sort of uh, photos and images that people take are what, inspires a lot of people to become interested in astronomy because of these quite mm. iconic images. Mm. And, and of course, Sombrero, because it's quite a bright galaxy. I mean, it doesn't look exactly like the photos, but it looks pretty good. It looks amazing. Yeah, and, no, it's and that's an inch, yeah. it looks very good. And of course, often with observing galaxies, um, I do wonder how much imagination that we use as, as you know, astronomers, because um, <laughs> quite often it can be just a very faint, uh, you know, barely perceptible gray smudge. Um, but these brighter galaxies like M83, Sombrero, uh, Centaurus A, they, they certainly, you know, they, you know, they don't look like their pictures, but they, you, you can certainly see a resemblance there. And it's just incredible to see, to think that, you know, these photons that are hitting your eye have been traveling for, you know, in some cases, tens of millions of years. And, and they died in your eye. Yeah. So, of course, we're so <laughs> like, excited about this. This is it. <laughs> well, that's it. We, we kill all those photons, which is a, you know, a bit rough but after that long journey. But of course, we get quite excited about this stuff, so we uh, want to share it with the audience. So we thought, well, okay, we'll make a video on how to find Sombrero Galaxy. Well, put it this way, at least someone has seen these photons. That's they right. didn't yeah. die for nothing. And it's, it's big deal. And, right? and they could have gone another 17,000 <laughs> light years <laughs> without well, a soul. Well, all the ones that missed us. Sort of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the next... Uh, yeah, the next planet. Planet. <laughs> well, one of the 36 um, civilizations. <laughs> In the galaxy, so um, that that's quite a popular. Um, we saw section of our site, and mm. of course now because we have uh, we're heading towards Matariki, we have a Matariki section in here, and um, it is another interesting conversation because now it's almost our national celebration, mm. um, but people still argue when it is, and so depending on which part of the country you are, uh, people celebrate, mainstream is um, celebrating it by, um, by the new moon. And that's um, people up in Tauranga and Jack Thatcher, um, the navigator is one of them. And um, that's what I will always say, they, they celebrate it by, uh, they observe it by the, by the new moon. Um, when they observe the heliacal rising of, uh, of Matariki, but there's, um, there's a lot of opinions. So um, if people feel confused as to when Matariki is, that's fine, so are we. Um, but it's a lunar celebration. So um, yeah, and every year it happens at a different time. So the last few years, we, we go to Mount Victoria in, in uh, central Wellington, up to the top of the a look out there. It was, it was a beautiful view over Wellington mm -hmm. Harbour and Wellington City. And we're often joined up there by a few other people, uh, which is quite, quite cool. Uh, last year, though, well, in fact, the last two years, it's, it's been cloudy. And the uh, yeah. uh, uh, year before last, we, we had a very fleeting glimpse of, of Matariki. We had a great view of, I think, it was Saturn at the time. So that yeah. was wonderful looking through the telescope while we're waiting for it to get a, you know, a little bit later and, and towards dawn. And then, of course, Matariki was visible. We had, but we had a layer of cloud to the to the north of Wellington, where it kind of sits on the hills up near the Tararua. So it was a little um, it was a little dis disconcerting for a while. But of course, last year it was um, very cloudy, and I think the best we could saw the best we saw was um, uh, we saw Sirius. I don't even think we saw Orion's Belt. Um, no. 
and we saw uh, a little bit of Hades. Well, we yeah. saw something, right? So, yeah, but we didn't see mm -hmm. um, we didn't see Mafriki, unfortunately. So, so this year Sam went and did um, a couple of videos, uh, which probably this is one of my favorites. I'm, I'm gonna try and see. If, um, I can just play a little bit out of it, and this is basically a fly through um, through the Pleiades, and you made it in. You, you actually programmed it in, right? Oh, yeah, I was. Um not that um, I'm not a, a visual effects person or anything by any stretch of the imagination, but what I, I got the Gaia to uh, the Gaia data release two data, um, and then chucked it in the blender and, and and tried to get the star colours roughly um, what they should look like, and it was just amazing to see, you know this cluster is so famous all around the world uh, you know Subaru and and. Uh, Japan, Matariki here, of course, Pleiades. Um, the chicken and the hen and my home in Romania. <laughs> yeah, all, all these different names. It's obviously very, you know, very important for many, many people. But I thought, well, okay, we look at these clusters. And because and I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, the, I guess, the science, I, I think, I wonder what it looks like. What, you know, what, 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 how are these stars separated? How do they relate to each other? And, and, of course, the coolest way to do that now with some of this great data that's freely available uh, and you go, in fact, you go on the Gaia archive on BSA's uh, website, and you can get this data for nothing. It's, and all you've got to do is, um, you know, uh, pour I over it and, <laughs> and try and make sense of it. Um, but you can, yeah, you can see a three-dimensional picture of the of the cluster, which is kind of cool, really, because then you get a, a bit of a sense for, you know, we only see it from one direction uh, as it looks almost like on this two-dimensional celestial sphere that we look at. But of course, looking at it in 3D, it's, it's it's you know quite different. So you purchased one of those other, um, or some of those other 36 uh, potential civilizations out there that may <laughs> well be looking at the same cluster, thinking, well, that one's not very interesting, <laughs> just because of the angles a bit different. So yeah. you've done the zodiacal constellations as well. Which one was your favourite? Oh wow! Um, well, actually, I was, I was looking at Sagittarius today. It's quite elaborate, um, but of course. When you when you sort of move around a bit three dimensionally, uh, they look completely uh, unusual because of the spread of the stars is so great, uh, the distances between them. Because we only see them from that one direction. But it's good to have different perspectives, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 So so that's a little bit about us, and we started writing this um, a few years ago, and um, that's basically what we do in our free time. <laughs> Yeah, we, we pretty much just do uh, space stuff. This is our time. hobby. The site is our hobby. Yeah. We do a lot of outreach uh, programs. So we have uh, around the Wellington region, we quite often go and talk to schools. We go to careers uh, days um, to talk to talk to the kids about, you know, what, what careers they can do relating to space. And, of course, this is a massive growing industry uh, now in New Zealand. We have good, good links with the Space Agency, um, tertiary Education um, Commission. Commission and uh, Ministry of Education. So, you know, being well, we've got all these government departments around, which are, which are quite easy for us to go and uh, check yeah. to and meet with. So, we have quite a few good contacts there. And of course, it means we, we've got good contacts, different programs to get out and talk to schools. Mm. So, another site that we have and we wanted to show you is the New Zealand Astrobiology Network, which is a charitable trust. And um, I'm the executive director. We're on the board of this um, uh, New Zealand Astrobiology Network, which was um, an amazing thing that that um, we ended up having here in New Zealand. And we, well, I'm, I'm very proud it happened. It, it started with um, asking the question, can New Zealand do astrobiology? And um, now we have this uh, um, established and we have programs that we've done. So here, these five programs are the programs that we've, we've done so far in, um, in, in these few years since, um, since we started. And we started under the, the um, Royal Astronomical Society of, uh, of New Zealand as the New Zealand Astrobiology Initiative. And um, yeah, I'll always be very grateful for their support. And with their help and support, we managed to organize the first NASA space were bound um, expedition in Rotorua where we had 50 scientists and teachers and students from New Zealand and scientists from NASA who came here to New Zealand and everybody hanged together um, and we, we went and we marveled at um, Extreme Life and um, looked for, for aliens in Rotorua and then um, we had Space Orbine New Zealand for Youth 
the next year, same thing. We went to, actually we went at a Marae and if you click on all these here, you, you can see um, kind of like oh, pictures and, and what we've done. Um, we had a teacher astrobiology workshop. We've been threatening them with a teacher course, which probably hopefully will happen this year um, as we um, get more time to get into these. And then we organized a first New Zealand um, astrobiology conference in 2018 and that was quite a mission 80 scientists from around the world to herd like cats it was absolutely beautiful and Sam did an amazing job to keep them on time <laughs> speaking but it was it was it wasn't was, easy. It wasn't easy. No, <laughs> no. But it was fantastic to have everybody here. And we had uh, two people from NASA. We had Seth Shostak, who's the chief alien. If uh, um, Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute, who's been a, a very long time supporter of our astrobiology network, and so we 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 begged him to come here. It wasn't too hard. <laughs> he yeah, actually said right yes, yeah. and and he was our main speaker. And uh, we had TV One interviewing him about aliens because that's what you do when you have Seth Shostak. And finally, in 2018, we decided to do a Mars mission. And the Mars mission is uh, linked to something I used to do in uh, um, a few years ago when I went to the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah and trained for Mars and decided that I cannot actually bring every single school kid from New Zealand to Utah because it's an impossibility. So then it's a bit far, it's a bit far yeah. And then, um, I mean, they did all... All of them have had those questions, how do you go toilet? Even if it's a simulated habitat in, uh, in here on Earth, um, that was also the very first question. So the, the situation with the toilet is uh, ever present. Doesn't matter what you do, <laughs> simulated or not, that's uh, the very first concern. Preoccupation. Well, preoccupation of the yeah. people involved. <laughs> so in, instead of that, we thought we, we bring Mars here to New Zealand. So we had Mitch Schulte, who's the chief scientist from the Perseverance rover that's going to be launching now in July yep. and Jen Blank, who is a scientist with the Curiosity rover, who again are very good uh, friends of the New Zealand Astrobiology Network and a couple of other people who came here and together with the school, the school gave us the children, the, the students for a whole week and they just, um, um, they said, just take them, <laughs> do whatever, do Mars and it, it was the best. So there's 550 um, students at the school and ranged in ages from, you know, the youngest five right through to uh, year 13. Yeah. And they had different activities on during the week. So some of the older kids were off on a school camp for a few days. So we had about, it was about 220 kids that we were, had occupied for, yeah, the whole week. For the whole week, yeah. And yeah. it was fantastic. We, we did, we dressed them up as astronauts. Uh, we had different missions out on the field. We did a geology mission, engineering mission, a mapping mission. Yeah. Uh, we had the, the mission control in the classroom. We gave uh, one radio to mission control and, and five radios to the group of five astronauts. Yeah and let them try and figure out how to communicate. Um, yeah, it, was good. it was really good fun. The, the kids absolutely loved it. They, they did three uh, astronaut missions um, run-throughs like that. So the first one was a bit of a shambles. They were sort of learning as they went. By the third one, they were, they were pros. They were, they yeah. were ready to launch. So, um, yeah, for us, it was amazing as well. We've learned so much and connected with them, and then we were very lucky after, after a year this year, yeah. This financial year, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. we were given the opportunity from the U.S. Embassy to invite a few of these children from school, school students, right? Mm. Um, of the students from the school to come and meet an astronaut, and that happened in um, here. This is uh, um, the picture when these students they they had breakfast with uh, with a real astronaut. So these are the uh, the five winners from yep. from the school and again like it was the best and uh, we're very grateful for all the support that we have from from all these people around us who help us promote space and and we we do this um so well this, if we could say a bit about the school so it was yeah. oxford area school in in the small town of oxford oxford which is just out of christchurch uh so it's a it's a reasonable size mm. but very much a rural town uh the, the school is an area school so you know it has a a very large community or a very widespread community that, that feeds students into it. Um, they have a very strong astronomical club. So they have their own observatory uh, that's looked after by a couple of very, very enthusiastic locals. So they're kind of unique in a lot of ways as a school that uh, has quite a long history with astronomy and a, and a lot of interest and a lot of support 
from the teachers and, and in particular um, Mike, the, the principal. So it, it was um, it was kind of the nexus of a lot of really kind of uh, enthusiastic people at the school, us, uh, the and, students. And um, yeah. also um, Eric Fermat, who actually yeah. had the idea to organize, a, and he called <laughs> me and he said, I want you to do a Mars mission like you did in Utah. And I said, I, we can't take people to Utah. <laughs> we have to do it something else. And so he um, he was the one who arranged for us to go there. Yeah. So so this is the school. These are some pictures from um, from there. These are pictures from the mission times. These um, this is Sam checking out the the equipment. These are the <laughs> students, astronauts, which we dress them up in uh, spacesuits. Actually, I have a, a a spacesuit right here. These spacesuits may look more familiar as blue overalls. <laughs> we've got a few patches. Uh, we got the kids to design a patch. They absolutely love that. And um, can we see that because we're sharing that? Yeah. Um, so the the kids designed the patch. This is the patch in here from, uh, um, and this was the winner winning design. And we just bought a lot of uh, patches. The NASA patches came for free with Mitch. Uh, and actually, I think these were the most uh, expensive pieces of equipment that we bought, the patches. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, the things that cost us the most. And uh, uh, other than that, it uh, was a quite quite an amazing and, and fun mission. Um, here is Mitch, Mitch Schulte and Jen Blank. I mean, these people work with the rovers that are on Mars. So these are people that really can tell that they, they, can they were say there. They work on Mars. Yeah. They work on Mars, <laughs> right? So they were talking to these students who had this opportunity to to learn firsthand about the geology of Mars, about uh, rovers on Mars, what, what's happening, atmosphere. I, it, it was a fantastic, mm. fantastic project. And hopefully we're going to um, have the chance to do to do more about this. But this year we are planning to do a um, Mars exhibition. Yep. And so that's what we're working on right now in terms of education and, and volunteering and, and projects with students. We we want to do a permanent Mars exhibition at Stonehenge Aotearoa. It's a tiny one. It's in their back room. So it's a yep. very tiny one. It's like three meters by three meters. But we went... Uh, um, with Ian. Yeah, Ian Cooper. Yeah, Ian Cooper and um, drove to Kafia. Yeah, we had to find some red dirt. And of course, um, unlike you know, Australia, there's not a whole lot of red dirt in New Zealand. So uh, there are a few patches around. And one of those patches is uh, up near Kafia. Well, actually on, on, on the harbour there. So we, we went up with Ian and had remembered years and years ago, <laughs> driving through the area and thinking, well, that's a bit like Mars. <laughs> <laughs> So he remembered a couple of uh, outcrops uh, there by the road. We, we got permission from the council to go and get a get a few kilos of of red red, red dirt. marks like dirt, yep. yeah. And and we deposited at Stonehenge Awatara. So now in the next couple of months, we'll be working our way through through this uh, exhibition hmm. to set up our, um, a kind of a little replica model of of a Martian field. landscape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we hope to see you there as well to to come and talk to us about this. And so th th these are um, a few of our projects um, right now. We also have a podcast on um, also on Milky Way Kiwi where every month we talk about what's in the night sky and we try to do some of these live as we were stargazing. Yep. Um, and one of them was too windy, so we had to redo it back in the, <laughs> in the office. Um, we're interviewing people as much as we can and every... We rope a lot of people into our podcasts. Funny, we don't get many visitors anymore. No, no, I don't <laughs> wonder why. <laughs> um, and one of the projects that we have as New Zealand Astrobiology Network, every year we have World Space Week, so from 5, 4 to, 4 to uh, 10 of October every year we are um, now promoting World Space Week, so saying to people, hey, let's let's do something. And it doesn't matter what it is. So like if you decide to do World Space Week this year, uh, you can just simply organize a film viewing about space or a talk or anything like that or make a school project. So it doesn't matter. Well, last year we were very lucky. We, we were in Europe and, and Harry is a member of the World Space Week Association. Um, so we got invited to the the... Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space meeting. I think it was the 52nd yep. meeting or something. 56th yep. yep. uh, 
meeting there in Vienna. At this was Kurs Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> but in the United Nations in Vienna. So we went along to this uh, United Nations yeah, meeting. Yeah, we was, were like, the United Nations were yeah. like, this is for real. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. And you see all the flags. And, and then um, they had a staff meeting, end of year staff meeting. So everybody. Kind of like the Christmas, the mid, Christmas party. The winter Christmas party. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I ate an ice cream that was about this big. That's all I remember. <laughs> But an amazing opportunity to see, uh, you know, uh, the, the space leaders from around the world um, in this one location, and you know, to talk to them, especially especially those from the smaller smaller countries, you know, like, like ourselves, who mm. who have quite you know fledgling um, space industries or uh, you know a lot of outreach outreach programs and stuff. And it was really uh, you know amazing opportunity to talk to these people and just to see what kind of programs they're doing. And then, of course, talking to, you know, people from the much larger countries with a lot more money and spending yeah. on the bigger programs, it was, it was quite fascinating. Mm. So, so this year, if you are wondering what to do during World Space Week, just uh, do anything that is related to space. The only trick is that you need to register your event, but we are highly encouraging you to do so. We also have a Facebook page where you can join the community. Um, we only let people in on um, the Facebook group that are organizers of events so that we can exchange experience and, and information and um, speakers. We went and we got space science speakers from uh, from around New Zealand and we sent them to libraries and connected them with the library mm. people. So we hope that you can help us this year. So with the with the World Space Week and, and to do these events because space is awesome and astronomy is awesome and, and everything that um, it's in this area is awesome. And that's why we're here, right? Everybody's a member of this club because we love space. Yeah, exactly. So one of the other things that we, we do and it is what well, Harry's really working quite hard on this at the moment is the dark sky uh, area. So we want to, you know, we want mm. um, you know Wellington to have a much darker sky. And Wellington's not too bad. It's you know it's a it's a city, um, you know, obviously not the size of Auckland, but it's uh, and we have a harbour which seems to soak up a little bit of the light. But you know it'd be really great if um, people in Wellington could see more of the night sky. So. Harry's been working uh, in, in part of in her role at, at Carter Observatory in a bit of a dark sky campaign mm. for, for Wellington. Yeah, and um, I, I wanted to start with, with something different. I wanted to um, um, show you something which is actually an example of citizen science. And I'll see if I can um, get this here. So citizen science is amazing because anybody can do and anybody can go out there and, and do science. And this is an example. I can't even pronounce this object and it is called um, Hanny's Warwick. 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 Who can Warwick. help us pronounce it would be uh, very welcome. James, <laughs> Chris, anybody? <laughs> And so okay, to, to pronounce it, honey's food vet. Food vet. Very good. That Very sounds common for so yeah. do I have, either be Dutch or Afrikaans. Right. I <laughs> think um honey is um she's Dutch. She was a, a school teacher, I think. I, I vaguely remember when, when when she discovered this object on the Galaxy Zoo. Uh, Which is highly ionized oxygen mm. that glows green <clears throat> in space. Um and and that's something that anybody can find right so she was doing galaxy zoo yeah and and this is a phenomenal thing there are 20 of them um i was just reading about them because they're they're absolutely fantastic objects to look at so so that's the power of citizen science and so for our citizen science here this is the project that we um we are doing right now at space place and we're launching the site on sunday so you're seeing the before launch the site, um, we have a campaign <laughs> that we call Look After Our Night Sky. And what we want to do is get people from Wellington to count the stars in the Southern Cross and register online and tell how many stars can they see in the Southern Cross by looking at a map, which is quite easy, right? But some people don't know where Southern Cross is. They don't know how to count the stars. So by doing this with them, we are trying to inspire them to actually want to learn more. So for people who would know where Saturn Cross is, they would be, yep, yeah, I know where this is. Um, it's easy. I'm just going to go and count the stars. And other people maybe ask themselves, um, right, 
um, how am I going to learn more about this? And 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 so engage them by appealing to, um, to to their collective power of producing science. And this project is actually so. There's like some details in here, and we talk about what is light pollution and and what is this about and and what does it do and right here under what can i do is basically um, a page which has instructions for people to go outside get them up and and the beauty of it is that is going to be happening every um, every month on new moon and this is a this is a a project that is actually made by globe at night which i'm going to find and open So Globe at Night are the people who put this project on. Here is their site. So all you have to do is just go there and, and um, I see they changed the name of the star. We told them to change Toliman to Alpha Centauri <laughs> and they did, that's very awesome. And, and so you go there, you, you count the stars, you register in here, uh, put the conditions in. This has happened before. It happened a few years ago, and a teacher was actually commenting on this on the Royal Society website, and she said that was an amazing project, but unfortunately, it was raining the whole week when the project was open, and how bad, and, and um, she thought it was very sad that she couldn't do it. Well, this year is open every single month. They have a new constellation for us to observe and to record and um, the data gets registered online immediately so uh, there is a, a all the tiny little dots that you will see on the map your observations you will see them instantly in there so that's fantastic so we can tell exactly how many people are there but it's really exciting and it's exciting because light pollution it's something that we're studying now to understand what what consequences has and it's, it's really bad it can blue light at night again that's another study that the royal society uh, undertook here in new zealand blue light at night can cause cancer so all these things we have no idea glare uh, a lot of people say oh yeah if, if we don't have uh, light at night how can we see the the bad people and the criminals but glare is really bad so we we, we actually say what we're saying is we should have um, light at night, but let's have good light at night that is helping us see rather than, than blinding us. And then we're going to look a little bit of the history, like why do we have light so much light in the streets um, at night? And it's because people in, in the old times, they were being raw, right? So they wanted to feel safe. But now safety is more than, than, um, uh, than just a bunch of astronomers complaining, like they complain about the Musk satellites. So, so light pollution is, is more than that, is, is actually beyond anything. It's, it's something that we need to study, we need to understand, and, and protect our night sky. Well, it's become an ecological yeah, issue. Yeah, an ecological issue. But, mm. but health and safety for people mm. is also very important, and that's kind of like very new. And so that's, um, this is the globe at night, and don't go necessarily on on our website but go on globe at night and register there and help us out do so this hmm? so yeah do this every month uh, this project is going to be fun we're going to learn about all these constellations count them and then make little dots on the map and that's the map here i don't know if they they have any any more dots um i think they disappear after a while like every month you have a, a different dot so we had our dot last month so, so this is the one-year project, the, the long-term project that we really hope that you can be a part of. But what I'm going to show you now, it's the short-term project, which um, I heard from it from Nalaini, Nalaini Brito, who is with the, he's on the Council of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. And when I told her that we want to do this in, in Wellington, the, the long-term one year, she said, oh, we also have a world record light that we want to promote. And this actually is half an hour of a project that is happening on um, Sunday. So this Sunday, and you have to register and do a half an hour course where you learn about light pollution. You learn about what you, you can look and see in the sky and what you can measure. And then if you pay $3, they give you a certificate as well. I didn't uh, pay anything. I just registered my name. <laughs> but um 
we put it out there and and Nalini and everybody like Steve Butler and Nalini, all people at, uh, at, at the Royal Astronomical Society, they're very excited about this, obviously it's on their, their page here. Um, and last night we went and changed all the banners from Facebook and uh, tried to get people to sign up and, and do this with us on, on, on Sunday and demonstrate that New Zealand is actually that, that one country that has the most amateur astronomers on the capita that any other country has seen. And we can prove that by, by participating in this project. And you know what's the beauty of it? Is that even if it's cloudy or raining, your contribution will still make a difference because you will just be recording rain and clouds. And it's still with, with Globe at night. So uh, so we really hope to see you there on, on Sunday. And then we really hope to see you there every new moon when um, when when the stars will be visible. Hopefully the weather will get away on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think that's from us. <laughs> yeah. If anybody has any questions. That's what we get up to. Do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so if anyone's got any questions, you can just pop them in the chat there. Uh, one of our viewers uh, was saying, um, you know, one of the things we could push for is better lighting design, um, yeah. which, uh, yeah, when I was in uh, Wellington, um, we started sort of advocating that up in church and park so when they built that new section up there uh, they used the downward um, facing mm. leds uh, i thought that was pretty good well i think in um in the wire wrapper the, the dark sky uh, group there it's quite I'm, I'm looking to have a reserve set up uh, and sort of going through that, that process and they've had uh, quite a bit of success with the local councils when they've come to redo their street lights uh, using the, uh, the different temperature following the 3000K um, light fixtures, just to get, you know, re really reduce that, that blue dome that's, that now sits over the towns. You know, yes, you know, well, not that long ago, it was a big yellow dome. <laughs> now it's a, sort of a blue dome. And it's quite interesting where we view it. It's down here in Jatiroa that you can see Masterton as a little blue dome and you can see in the distance Wellington as a slightly bigger blue dome. Um, it would be great, you know, to, to get rid of that. <laughs> so any of our people up here, if you haven't been to Stonehenge Jatiroa, uh, it's definitely a, a fantastic place to go to. Um, I've spent a lot of time there when I was down in Wellington. I always make a point of going there whenever I'm down there. Um, uh, if you just go during the day as well and uh, take the, the tour of the Henge, uh, you learn so much. Um, Richard Hall's an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if you can get out there at night and have a look with, with the big telescopes, um, or uh, even if you go to the star dates, um, it's really, really fantastic. So I've got another question, uh, Harry. Um, someone was asking about your experiences in the Mars habitat. What was it like? Oh yeah, I can talk about that. Well, how many years did they have to? <laughs> uh -huh. um, it was life changing. And I've been in total in, involved in four missions. First mission that, um, um, I went there was with the um, Romanian Space Agency and they sent us there as a crew. Uh, it was, as I was saying, totally life-changing. I'm a scientist, so I, I, I do science. That's my background. And now I do science communication, but I come from science. But it felt like a spiritual experience. And I'm saying this um, because it it totally made me ponder and and I realized what my priorities were and the, the beautiful um, I'll see if I can google it let me just just have a, a tiny look the, the beautiful thing about that is that um, you're there and you have people from all over the world from all religions all sciences or like anything you can imagine people have been there since 2001 every two weeks there is another crew coming and, and they do something else. And everybody in there is with, um, it's with Mars. Everybody in there, it's, it's, uh, it's, working, it's working with Mars. 
So here is a um, here is a page. This is uh, this is one of our our um, habitats. So this is how it looks like inside. Okay, um, just let me let me time. try and get the page because I've lost it. Um, um, can you see it now? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so this was kiwi. This is the New Zealand kiwi um, bird. And this is how big a room is in that habitat. And so someone made a beautiful drawing in here and that was the only thing that was uh, that was kept, but it, it was just phenomenal. And I'll just show you around. This wasn't actually, this was the room of one of my crews. Um, and it's, it's this claustrophobic. Is this bad to be there? And I'll show you some, um, some pictures from there as well. So here is, this is the habitat and, and it's just fantastic. You go there and you dress up. Um, it's got two, two, two levels. These are the crew car quarters. Um, there are science labs down the, the habitat. This is a, a view from, uh, from an, um, drone and maybe just wanted to see. Yeah, in here. And um, Ali, my crew member, she had a, a Go, uh, not a GoPro, a um, uh, 360 um, head for a camera that she used, the same technology that they sent on Mars. And that's actually how it looked downstairs. This was the toilet here, just beyond this, <laughs> beyond this airlock. And these were our places where, where we stayed and worked for uh, for for two weeks. This is where we would change our suits. And this was the access stairway mm -hmm. to upstairs. I mean, it was just insane. But it was, and this is the Mars flag in there. Um, and microscopes, and these were like stones that we'd be collecting and, um, if I can zoom in. Ah, uh, Gigapan is called. This is, so this is, this is made with the Gigapan. So you can see that. Hopefully we can, that's the maximum we can zoom, but that's quite a big zoom. So. Um, and I'll see if I have a picture with us in uh, um, in uniforms, suited up and stuff. This is a picture I took, which I love it because um, it's about perspectives and obviously it's upside down. But mm -hmm. you just said you just yeah, it's the Milky Way Kiwi is here, and I just said just follow the Milky Way Kiwi and uh, um, you'll get there. Um, that was our mission mission patch. Um, so so yeah, it was. Um, it was it was life changing and and absolutely absolutely fantastic and we had the huge the biggest outreach um, event. I've got a yeah mission logs in here. So if you go in here on the mission, that's us uh, in the first day when we when we got there. And I'll just get some random uh, pictures um, of the, the things we were doing. But if you go on this website on Kiwi Space, um, you're gonna see every single blog and journal. Uh, and you had all these reports that we had to do every day and, and just read. Like, if you want to know how it was, just read, because that's the reason why we put them there, because um, we wanted people to, to find out. And, and um, we had, this is the education log here. So these were like all the schools that came through. I collaborated with Cut Observatory. They were the mission control kids would come. These were the questions that, um, that they would ask us. So it was, um, it was fun and it was amazing and, and it was life changing. And I, I, you know, it's like, you realize that you only, I realized that I only live once and that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It was space. And so that made me do everything in my power to actually find a job that it's directly related to space or space education, which is why now I'm the senior science communication for space, the space place. And so um, I think experiences like this can, it's like make it or break it. Um, <laughs> I think, I don't know what, which one it was with me. So that's us at the last day we had a, um, we brought a stone from Wellington um, and we buried it there. We, we made a, a, a Pacific, a Polynesian star compass, like the ones that they, uh, they talk about uh, with the navigators and how, how they were, um, there was all those stones that you can see in here. These are all directions, markers. And uh, one of our crew, Bruce Nataerua, he, uh, he's Maori. So he was the one who 
kind of like uh, um, head the ceremony and, and we, we did all these things. So we have a, a Polynesian star compass on the Mars mission and we learned how to navigate by the stars. It was fantastic. So one of the question I've got um, is how, how does someone get onto one of these missions? You can apply. Um, I went first with the Romanian Space Agency and then uh, the way I got there for the next three missions is because I organized them. Um, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> the, one. Yeah, like just organized <laughs> one and, and uh, but usually you can apply for, uh, for them or get in contact with us. Usually now, well, when I went there, there weren't so many people who were going. Now there's like a huge queue. But if people are really keen, um, yeah, just just tell them to get in contact with with me and um, we had a, a chat. We had a New Zealand student went uh, late last year yeah. on an Australian mm. organised mission. So the Australian uh, Mars Society gave us uh, the opportunity to put, put a New Zealand two on, people. On two people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was um that was pretty cool. So it does it still happens yeah. Like, yeah, quite often. Yeah, yeah, but you know, like you select people because you know if people are very hardworking and and you see they're they love doing this and they can contribute. If if people come with projects that they can do, there usually yeah. you go there and do science projects. I I got selected and I I got to organize the the missions there because i went to the mars society in the u.s and i said i want to do outreach with schools and i want us to go there and i want schools from new zealand to connect with us and see that we're there on on this mars analog and see that mars missions are possible and it's for them in their future that maybe some of these kids that we related with went on uh so, you know went on on our um link maybe they will have the opportunity to work on Mars missions for real, right? So I'll never go to Mars, but I train there because um, I, I, I know that we can come here back to New Zealand and train the, the, the new generation that they will take, take from us. So anybody who has a serious proposal, uh, a serious project, we're, we're very supportive and, and um, we will do help them to, to get there on, on MDRS. I think, sure. I think one of the, the cool things to sort of think about is, you know, there's kids, there's kids at school now, you know, younger kids mm. probably, that, you know, they're in the in that age group that, uh, you know, will be going to Mars. Uh, you know, they'll they'll be, and, and it's a very real possibility for New Zealanders. Uh, it's not something that was uh, now that is just exclusively an American or a European thing. You know, space is, is really... Um, pro, pro, it's everywhere really, <laughs> space is everywhere, yeah. but um, the access to space is now, you know, in so many different places, you know, New Zealand is involved with you know, Rocket Lab, we, we have an agency, so we've got all these, uh, these plugs into and opportunities, there's New Zealanders going and doing um, internships, like uh, Hari did a, an internship at NASA Ames, and this is happening as a regular occurrence now. So we have an intern now with the New Zealand Astrobiology Network, and she got a mini internship online with um, colleagues of ours from the Blue Marble Space Institute, who actually work from NASA. And so she came and volunteered with us, and she's doing a lot of amazing work. And and now she worked with these people at the MSIS, and you know, hopefully. She will meet even more scientists um, who, who, um, who knows, maybe she'll go and work at NASA one day as well. Yeah, which is a you know, fantastic opportunity. Yeah. So I've got another question. Um, what is astrobiology? Good no, question. Yeah, That's good the best question. Yeah. Very it's good. Made, it's made up of three questions. Thank you for your <laughs> question. That's a very good one. <laughs> well, astrobiology is, um, is, is like this. I always say to people, imagine... Imagine an orchestra and a concert, and, and astrobiology is the concert and is the music that comes out of the concert. And um, I compare it with rocket science, and the rocket science is the vehicle that you use to go to that concert. So astrobiology is an umbrella discipline that seeks to answer three questions that people have right now, and we don't know what the answer is. The very first question is, what is life? And you probably, because I, I did the same, so I, you know, I wouldn't blame you if you would think the same, because that was my first reaction. Surely someone knows what life is. Like, surely out of all these scientists around Earth who work on, on life understanding, life detection, and life science, and everything, like, surely someone has a definition of life, right? Um, there isn't one. 
we, we don't know what we do know is that we're made of stardust what we do know is that every single tiny little bit of us except for maybe some hydrogen was once in the heart of a star but what we don't know it's how these chemical elements, what was that thing that made them live? So that's the one question that astrobiology has. The second question that astrobiology is trying to answer is um, aliens, right? Everybody loves aliens. Where is everybody? Oh, where are all those 36 civilizations in our galaxy? Well, the, the closest is 17,000 light years. Where are they? <laughs> Which part of the, of the star compass are those, uh, those civilizations 17,000 light years away? Yeah. Um, and, and you do maths, you do Drake equation, you do, you do all these calculations and you're trying to find out. You, you're like, uh, maybe we shouldn't contact them. Maybe aliens are going to come and eat us. So all that stuff, Seth Shostak is really good at it. Mm. Um, and he, um, he, yeah, he, he was, he was saying, right. He was like, he was like, we're like dinosaurs. He was saying, right. <laughs> like we're like dinosaurs looking for sauropods, whereas we should look for, for other species. We don't even know how to look properly for aliens, let alone finding them. Yeah. Because we're kind of looking for stuff a bit like us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but he said like, you should look for stars that disappear. There are actually a few stars that disappear. Mm. So. You know, because then you go into Dyson spheres and things like that, and it's like it's it's a never a never ending never ending subject, right? So that's the second second question, and probably my favorite question, which is like at the basis of everything we've done, and and that's the question that is fueling us to to do all these things, is what is the future of humankind? What is the future of life on Earth here? You know, what are we gonna do with Earth? Are we going to become a spacefaring civilization? So what's the future of humankind? That's the, that's the third question that astrobiology is trying to answer. And uh, hopefully we, we, can, we can solve that one because what we know for now until, you know, from everything we've learned is that every single one of us can make the difference in, in this future that we're creating together. Yeah, the thing that's been amazing to me is... Uh, how how we have advanced in the last sort of five ten years uh in, in sort of all areas our understanding of uh potential life out there uh, where we can actually look for life out there um you know, I, I just find it so amazing and now you know with sort of these private companies getting involved um, our ability to go to these places is suddenly within reach. Uh, Sam, as you said, um, you know, the generation that's at school now could quite easily be the generation that's sitting, you know, up in, on Mars, uh, on the moon, you know. Uh, well, I think that's quite amazing compared to, you know, when I was a kid and, you know, I wanted to do astronomy so badly, but there was just no way I could ever do it. Uh, Back in South Africa, um, you know, the scope was so narrow. You know, today, it, you know, it's, it's quite an exciting thing. It's like almost I like the IT was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like when I was a kid, IT was the, the way of the future. Computers were coming out, you know, and you could see uh, you know, working in that field, which our parents didn't have that opportunity. And I feel like space, you know, the space industry right now is exactly the same thing. You know, I look now and I think, you know, if I was a kid now, I can just see where it's going to go and you know, all that endless possibility. So for me, it's really, really exciting. I'll tell you. Anyway, thank you very much, guys. Um, we really appreciate you taking up your time uh, to come and have a chat with us. Um, uh, people, no. that, people in the chat are all saying thank you for an excellent, interesting talk. Um, and I quite agree. Um, yeah, I, I really want to thank you guys for, for coming along. It, it's been great. So I'm just going to pop back on here for a sec, uh, if you guys hang on there. Um, so to everyone else, uh, thank you for uh, joining the meeting tonight. 
Uh, don't forget to keep an ear out on our Facebook pages or email uh, about the forthcoming uh, meetings. They should be in person. I'm hoping they're in person and I'm hoping that we're going to have clear skies as well so we can do a bit of uh, observation as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, keep, keep an eye out for that. So uh, thank you everyone uh, and I hope you all have a very good evening. Good night. Okay.